You know, whenever we think about uh, God's presence and, you know, the body of Christ, you know, we're all cut from different molds, you know, and uh, if you don't realize that, you're probably moldy. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we realize God's goodness and God's graciousness to us. Um, a few announcements. I want to remind everyone that if you make contributions, uh, you want to write, send in a contribution, you may do so to Wimber Assembly, Box 361, uh, Wimber, PA, 15963, Box 361, Wimber, PA. Also, um, we have offering plates around the sanctuary. And Wednesday night, we are finishing, hopefully, finishing the Book of Revelation. So on our Wednesday night study at 7 o'clock, and then, of course, Sun, Saturday morning at 9.30, the ladies have their Bible study, and uh, you ladies are invited. And of course, then Sunday morning, 9.45, Sunday school and 10.45 church. So we are grateful for those things. I um, believe that's all the announcements. Uh, Thanksgiving's just a <laughs> week and a half away. Wow, imagine that. Where did it yeah, kind of snuck up on us. So it's a, a different Thanksgiving. We hope that the, this COVID thing would be behind us by now, but it's still in front of us. So um, I'm sure a lot of families, um, whether you're going to be together or not, or travel or not, and they're all kind of those things, but we need to be careful. Uh, you know, wear your mask and uh, social distancing and wash your hands, you know. Um, the the virus is something that is unknown and you can't see it, but it doesn't mean we're afraid of it. We just need to do keep our precautions. So keeping your hands washed and keeping your fingers out of your eyes. <laughs> you know, you don't realize how often you rub your eyes. And uh, that's the incubator for, the, for any of the cold or flu season. You know, you have the germs, bacteria on your hands and then you wipe them in your eyes and there goes your incubator, and you start the uh, process. So keep your hands off your eyes, you know? Keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so everybody's rubbing their eye, you know? <laughs> yeah, it makes you think about it. Don't blink! <laughs> yeah, everybody starts blinking. Well, the last couple of Sundays, um, two Sundays, we spoke, spoke about... Um, I have a story, and basically we are recognizing that we have a testimony. We have something of, <laughs> I always, a testimony, we've got a test that we have gone through successfully. <laughs> so that's a testimony, and uh, a test that we have not gone through successfully, we don't share that. <laughs> because we know that only Christians are victorious. You know, successful Christians are always victorious in everything that they do. Amen. You know, that's not true. <laughs> we, we run into difficulties, and we have difficulties, and we have troubles, and we have trials, and it doesn't seem like they work out. But that's not the case. We are always trusting that the Lord is going to work them out. We are placing them. We don't live on denial, okay? Denial is not faith. Faith is not denial. Faith is a trust in God that he will work in the situation, Denial is there is no situation. <laughs> you know, it's like um, denial is there are no leaves in my yard. <laughs> you know, when it's covered with leaves, you know, uh, denial is there are no leaves. Well, faith is there's a lot of leaves in my yard, but you know, with help, we're going to get them cleaned up. See? So faith is that, faith is not denying the facts and denying the reality of what happened. Jesus always did that. You know, he, he walked up to the blind man and he says, uh, what is it you want me to do? <laughs> he walked the lame man, you know, what, what, what would you like me to do? He, he's always asking the question because he wanted them, the individual, to state what it was that was going on. It wasn't like, Jesus, I perceive that you have a problem. <laughs> no. He knew it. He was aware of it. But he didn't, <laughs> he wanted the individual to come to a realization of what was in their life and what the problem was and then have a very real problem we have a very real savior you know I, I have faults I have failures I've fallen I all that kind of stuff well I have a savior I have a, the Holy Spirit I have a strengthener that will come and help me to support me to encourage me 
So these are the things that we have in God. Well, this morning, I thought I would do God's story, the entire book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> okay, what time are we going to finish today, Pastor? <laughs> nah, I'm not going to do the entire book of the Bible. But the idea is, do you, did you know that God has a story? We're just going to do the first couple chapters of Genesis to ease your mind, okay? So, so didn't want you to, the faint of heart, you know? Would you imagine if you went to a church that they stayed for two or three hours? Oh, my goodness. What do you do for three hours, you know? I've never been to one, but, <laughs> but you know. But that's just not who we are, not what our culture, um, culture says to us. But God brings his story to life. And do you know what God's story is? It's history. <laughs> history is God's story. And, uh, it, you know, the events and the trials and the difficulties and all these crazy things that's gone on through the centuries, we wonder, how is God in all of this? Well, God has a way of presenting and always had a remnant He's always had a remnant of people throughout history that have been his faithful followers. And we find that God's story goes back to before creation. That before the beginning began, I always refer to it, that before the beginning started, we have references, we have no reference to time. Time is the beginning of time. <laughs> Before that, it's eternity. Eternity passed, time comes into existence because of creation. And then at the end, when God creates the new heaven and the new earth, we have eternity future. And sandwiched between these two eternities is what we call time. And so we are in this place called time. And um, we find that God has a way of, in the fullness of time, Jesus came. So we'll be talking about that at Christmas, that uh, the prophet said in the fullness of time, Jesus came. So before the beginning began, God knew that there was a fullness of time in which Christ would come. So if God in his foreknowledge is able to, and he is, to de determine a predetermined a pre point in time, that his son is to be, that Jesus, the, the son of God, the fullness of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's able to come in the fullness of time. Well, we know that before it all began, he knew what was happening and he knew what was going on. And so we find that as we look at all of this, start putting together God's story, you know, the first thing that comes to us, and, and we'll bring it up in, in a little bit later, but in, in a different context, is did God really say that? <laughs> did God, did that, is that really true? You know, is there really a God behind all of this? Is that really what God meant? <laughs> well, it's interesting how that sin is so straightforward and deceptive in the questioning. You know, if you listen to some of the reporters and news agencies and things like that, you listen to their questions it's like they formulate these questions in which there is no way to answer them except the way they want you to say it. So there, there must be, they must spend hours of people contemplating and writing and putting these questions together so that they, <clears throat> the only, if you say yes, you're, you're wrong. If you say no, you're wrong. <laughs> it's like, so, not saying that there's sin, but the idea is that whenever we are looking at our life, Sometimes we feel like we have no options. Sometimes we feel like there is nothing more to us than this that is before us, and if we do it, we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. I remember uh, an individual that um, was a CEO. He told me when I was a chaplain under his reign, at the, at, uh, and he said, uh, he said, I was always, you know, coming in and questioning and, you know, because I knew things were wrong. And he told me, well, as, things, as far as things are between me and my God, they're okay. And when push comes to shove, you're the first one fired. Now, what do you want? I said, I think I'm okay. <laughs> 
So you see, people have a way of justifying their lives and justifying what's going on, but we're not in here, not looking at the scriptures and not looking at God for finding some way to justify us. We're looking to find Christ and how the God forgives us and he justifies us. He forgives us of our sin. He allows his presence and his Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and lives and there it changes us from the inside out. We're, not, we're changed from the from the roots of who we are to how that we live our life and how we, how we begin. So we begin this God story by looking at Genesis, okay? Genesis is creation. And if you look at the first of creation, it's free of problems. It's full of promises. And here we have Genesis, the beginning, the origin of all things. So Genesis then unfolds for us Uh, The beginning of human history, the beginning of family, the beginning of civilization, the beginning of salvation. So Genesis is a story of God's purpose and plan for his creation. Sounds good. Sounds like God's creating it. It's got to be good. Amen. Thank you. So Genesis then, the story of God's purpose and plan for his creation. So it starts by... As we look at this, it's setting the stage for the rest of the Bible. Hmm. It reveals the person and nature of God. It's interesting, the Bible, the Bible doesn't start off by explaining God. It just says, God is. Boom. Well, why doesn't he explain himself? No, he doesn't have to explain himself. He's God. And, and if, he ha- if he did have to explain himself, then people would say they would, li- they would not like the application. You know, this can't be true. So we have to accept and understand that God is God and he is just, he's there. He always has been, he always will be. So the Genesis reveals the value and the dignity of human beings because we're made in the image of God and in his likeness he created us. He reveals, Genesis reveals the tragedy and the consequences of sin the fall, the separation from God. And Genesis reveals the promise and assurance of salvation. It reveals a covenant, an agreement. Now, it's not a contract. Contracts are between basically two equal parties. They are both satisfied with the interaction. You enter into a contract, promise to do something, promise to pay something. So you have this contract. Well, a covenant isn't a contract. A covenant, in this case, is God's agreement with us. And some of God's covenants, agreements, are stipulated. If my people, you know, they're conditional. But some of the covenants that God has made with us is unconditional. God said, this is how it is. And this is what I've set forth for you. And he wants us then to understand as we agree to that, we are finding this relationship with God, and we are finding a place where we can find our true purpose of who we are. So, with God, (laughs) that's where Genesis begins. We see God creating. He see him creating by his spoken word. Now, I I always am uh, intrigued by some people, you can't believe a word they say. I mean, you know, you've been around them long enough to know if they say it's, they're going to do it on Tuesday, it's not going to be done. You know, you can, just, you, can, you can count on that, you know. It's not going to happen. And then there are other people that if they say something, that, you know, they're going to be there on time or 10 minutes early. Some people are going to be, you know, whatever, not going to fulfill their contract. They're not going to fulfill their obligations. It doesn't matter what they tell you. I remember this one individual, he, uh, he was... Uh, I'll leave out what he was. But anyhow, he, anything that the, the person told you, you knew he couldn't do. Because he always had this scheme of things of how this should work. And you know, whenever he would come to help, and he would be there to help, he would stand there and tell you how you were supposed to do something. But he couldn't help you do it. But he knew how you were supposed to do it. And if you did it the way he wanted, it wasn't going to work out because he hadn't a clue. Just made it all up as he stood there. And, and, you know, he had had no hands-on ability. None whatsoever. So, 
God is not like that. Genesis chapter 1, verse 6. And God said, so notice that what, what happens is God speaks. See, whenever we talk about the word of God, the scriptures, he wants us to pray. Whenever we pray, we pray the scriptures because the word of God is God's, the word of God is Christ. Christ is the word. He is the word made flesh and dwelt among us. So we have the visible expression of the invisible God. And we have the context of that invisible expression in a visible God through Jesus Christ. We have his word spoken to us so that we can hear and see this word in action. So that word is so powerful that when God speaks it, what happens is it comes into existence. So and God said, let there be uh, an expansion of space. <laughs> Basically, let there be a space between things called sky. <laughs> so um, in verse 9, and God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered into one place. We'll call the one dry ground and the other sea. I said, well, you know, God, he ain't too bright, is he? <laughs> Water, sea, land. Well, you know, whenever God is creating, there was all of this nothingness, and he began to separate the nothingness into something. So the scripture says, that which you see didn't come by that which appears. So thousands of years ago, God knew how people would think. You know, we've got these molecular things of things being attracted and the static and spe pieces of dust and globs and coming together over billions and trillions of multiple billions of years, and they form cylindrical planets <laughs> equally spaced throughout space and balanced so precisely that they all keep one another in balance. And they rotate in such a way that we can know time and months and seasons. That which happens does not come from that which does appear. It was spoken into existence. And God said, let the land produce vegetables. Vegetation. So eat your vegetables. Okay, no, that's why. <laughs> let the land produce vegetation. And then verse 14. What did God create here? Is it up there? Light. There were no sun, no moon, no stars. How did he see what he was doing? <laughs> Light did not exist until this particular place. So looking at this, you know, we look at, and we've been studying in the book of Revelation, how that Jesus, that God is the light. There'll be no sun, moon, and stars in the new heaven and the new earth. Out here when it's all over and done, there'll be no sun, moon, and stars. Why? Because God is the light. Well, God is the light of the past. And before there was the creation of the sun, the moon, and the stars, God is the light. Just a thought. And so he makes the sky, he makes the stars in the sky, he puts the <laughs> sun in its place, and you can know that by the rotation of the day and rotation of the planets and the months and the years and the seasons. Did you know, and I always, sometimes people just miss these things, maybe growing up, but when I made a declaration once that, just once though, I made a declaration, <laughs> that, uh, you know, the stars are always shining, it's just that in the daytime you can't see them. And in, after church, the individual come up to me and says, is that true? I said, what? I mean, this is an adult. I said, he says, is that true? Stars are still there when you, in the daylight? I said, yeah, they're still there. It's just that the sun is so bright. He goes, wow, I learned something today. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't take very much just to inspire people, you know? <laughs> so We try, we try. In verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, and God made wild animals according to their kind, livestock according to their kind, and so we find that the animals have continued to do such things after their own kind. There is no intermingling of the species. 
It's after their own kind. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. Hmm. There's a consistency here. Verse 27. God created. (laughs) God created. He created man in his own image, in his likeness. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we have this creation, and creation is different than God said. He didn't speak man into existence. He formed man, and we have, we have a couple of chapters, you know, chapter 1 and chapter 2, and we look at it, and it's basically saying the same thing, but it's saying it from different perspectives. The first chapter is a, basically God's perspective of this, and the other is somewhat of man's perspective of the same, same, same events. And what happens here is God created by, in, in the other, other places we have him speaking these things into existence. And see, that's why, it's why whenever we're, we're made in the image of God, and God wants us to speak correctly. Okay, speak correctly. Does that mean we can use proper English and that we, you know, we're capable of writing things in, in the way that literary individuals would be able to write? Well, yes, we're supposed to do that. But speaking correctly is that we are to speak what we believe. I don't believe any good's going to come of this. Is that really what you believe? I don't think this is ever going to work out. Is that what you really believe? You see, when we speak, we we hear ourselves say. And we start, whatever you say and whatever we think and we put them into words and we put them out there, we, we are starting a direction. We are starting a direction with our life. I don't think this is gonna work. You know, I tried this before and it never worked and I've done this and you know, life's against me and you know, things don't work out the way that I want and it just, What path are we on? And people talk themselves into defeat. They look for discouraging things. They, you know, there there are individuals, and we happen to know, I happen to know one or two, that, you know, if you hear them, you don't want to believe anything they say because it's always tainted, it's always twisted, and it's never any good. Even if you're in the same meeting with them, and they, the person says something, and they walk out, and you feel pretty uplifted, uplifted, this person is going to come to you and tell you what those people didn't really tell you. <laughs> and they are going to twist it, and they're going to turn it, and by the time they're done with it, it's like, wow, I didn't hear that. <laughs> God says, speak, speak, speak what you believe. Speak what you want to happen. I'm believing for this to happen. So I'm believing that good is going to come of this. I believe that God is going to have his way in this. I don't understand it. I don't, you know, see, don't have to understand it. We're putting faith into it because we are believing what God has said and we are speaking his word because the, what do they call that in school? Uh, Self-fulfilling prophecies that you are prophetic in your vocabulary. Never thought, did you ever think of that? You are a prophet foretelling the future with your vocabulary, with your words, with your ideas, and how you approach life. If you are one who says, I can't do, you are the person who doesn't do. (laughs) There are people who come out of their house, won't go out of their house because they're afraid. I can't go out there, I'm going to get sick. Now, they may get sick, but but being fear, you put yourself in your own cage. You put yourself in your own prison. So we look at this, and we we want to be a prophet for our own good. So that's why we say what we really intend and what we really believe. In denial, remember, denial is not faith. Faith is not denial. Denial says, I said this in Sunday school, denial says... um, There are no leaves in my front yard. (laughs) That's denial. Faith says there's lots of leaves in my front yard, but with help and with work, we're going to get them cleaned up. 
You see, we don't have to deny something exists. We have to see what it is for what it is and then deal with it in a healing way. That's what God looked at and he created. So God's story sets life in motion. God's story sets life in motion. God's creative acts put the world and the universe into existence, put the stars in the sky, put it all into existence. He spoke them and they came into existence. He spoke and he gave little nudges to separating water and sky and earth and land and animals and then he breathed into man the breath of life and we became a living soul and we would live forever. Hmm. In chapter 2, verse 22, the Lord God made a woman. Oh, well, we won't go there. <laughs> Just kidding. Got more women, you didn't bring your tomatoes today, so. The Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken from man. You see, God's story, the story has purpose. Now, I know I have lots of stories about, you know, men and women, but we'll do this one. God did not create woman from a man's foot that would she, be, she would be walked on. God did not create woman from man's hand that she would be his servant. God did not create her from his head that she would be his superior. He created her from her so his side that they could walk together equally. Okay, ladies, come on now. <laughs> all right. I didn't do all the other ones, and I didn't let them all go, but, this, but that's what it is. So he placed Adam and Eve in a perfect paradise, a perfect paradise, a perfect surrounding. And everything that God had created, they were in charge of, and God said, this is your place. And, and every day he comes down and, walk with, and walks with him. If you want to know what our purpose is, our purpose is to walk with God and be the husbandman, be the worker, the guy who is in charge of our garden, of our life. Walk with God and be in charge of what's going on in your life. Trim it up, take care of it, plant it, all works. So, the purpose of creation is God's expression of love for mankind. <laughs> purpose of creation? was God's expression of love for mankind. Well, if God wanted, really loved us, why did he put a tree in the middle there that he told us not to eat of? Because true freedom comes from knowing what you cannot do. <laughs> you say, what? The? No, 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 no. Being able to do everything is freedom. No. Doing everything ends up being in bondage. God gave us 10 restrictions that deal with relationships. Relationship with God and relationship with people. And if you break those relationships, you end up hurting yourself. So he says, these are 10 things that I want you to keep in mind when you're doing things so you'll have a right relationship with God and a right relationship with people. Don't break that because that in doing that, you will find yourself having complete and total freedom. <laughs> Genesis 3.1. The serpent was more crafty than all the rest. Satan used the, the snake, what we call as the snake. Um, and the, the question was, did God really say? <laughs> did God really say? Is that what God really meant? Eve, you know. Now, Eve knew that she was not too eat of the tree. But she says this, he, you know, Satan says this to, to, to Eve. And she, Eve says, we may eat fruit from the tree of the garden, from all the trees. Hath God really said you shouldn't eat any fruit of the garden? No, 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 that's not true. We're allowed to eat of all the trees in the garden. But God said, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. What happens whenever we don't know what God has said. We start to expand it. You know, there's lots of denominations and religions out there that take some form of what God says and expand, they expand it to mean other things than what it does. 
and it ends up tripping up people and causing them to be tied up in their relationship with people and relationship in the world, and they, you know, God is seen as some fanatic. <laughs> well, Satan is the same old trick. Eve doubted God's goodness, and Satan implied that God was strict, stingy, selfish, and he did not want Eve to share in his knowledge of good and evil. You know, when we say that you shouldn't do those things, don't steal, don't kill, don't bear false witness, don't do those things, you're just being stingy and selfish, and you're just because you don't want me to have those things. Because the only way I'm going to get them is to steal them, to take them. to you know. But you see how that, what happens? We start that scenario, and why did we get there? Because Satan and his tricks get us to doubt what our true freedom really is. So he tries to get Eve to forget all that God had given her. Instead, focus on what God had forbidden. And when we start looking at sin and things that will take away from us, we start looking at what we don't have. You know, that's our culture. That's the, the whole idea of advertising. This is what you don't have. And if you will just get this, you will find happiness. Should put on some beer commercials. All you need is this, and you'll have friends, and you'll have company. I remember the one years ago, there was this, these uh, uh, cowboys out in the wilderness, and they're out there drinking beer, and suddenly all these ladies show up, and all your heart's desire will come if you drink this beer. <laughs> You know, it's like, but that's our society. We want what we don't have. And if we have it, it's really not that good because you've got it. And you really don't have to listen because if you have to listen, then you're not going to really be happy. So on and on the whole thing goes. So Satan misled Eve concerning the right way to accomplish her desire to be like God. Now, trying to be like God, you know, we used to sing a song years ago, to be like Jesus. That's all I ask from here to glory is to be like him, you know? And that's a, that's a good desire. Well, Satan twisted that and said, God doesn't, God want, God's afraid that you'll be like him. So if you will eat of this fruit, you will know the difference between good and evil. Well, we do not have to listen to anyone but yourself. So the consequences of sin and Adam and Eve, they were expelled from the garden. Serpent crawled on the dust of the earth, cursed of all the livestock and the animals. And it came with a promise that he, Jesus is what the implication is, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Over and over again, when in the birth of Christ, the life of Jesus, the crucifixion, the temptations, all those times Satan is trying to strike Jesus, and every time he gets his head crushed. <laughs> and at the, at the resurrection, he is, uh, he is crushed, his head is crushed. His, his whole desires for life and worship and being like God is crushed, and now he has only a limited time left. And so he's trying to, trying to get the best of God's creation. So God has a story. And the story may look like Adam and Eve and they get expelled from the garden and they can't go back there, but they are forced to leave the garden and they are clothed in animal skins. It means that it wasn't because they were naked. It was because God had a sacrifice for them so that when they left, left the garden, they had a covering spiritually and they had a covering physically. And the covering was without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sin. The promise that God was going to put into effect hundreds of years later is now put into effect in Adam, with Adam and Eve. Satan's plan against us, and I'll close with this, 
is to bring doubt. God's plan is to bring faith. God's story is a story that tells us what the truth is. Now you get to choose. Choose what is best. As for me, Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So there is a declaration of promise. There's a declaration of intent. There's a declaration, this is the way I'm going, and we're going to do this. Does it mean it's perfect and will never fail? No. It means that this is the path I'm on, and I'm going to keep on speaking the truth of God's word into my life so that God's promises can come to fulfillment. Satan's plan is to get you to doubt, question God, and question God's word. Is this really God? Satan's plan is to be to bring discouragement. You look at the problem instead of God. I can tell you how big my problem is, or I can tell you how big God is. What do you choose? Diversion. Satan makes the wrong things seem attractive. We've got to know what God's intent is and that what the truth is. And, you know, this looks really good, but I, I know this is the way I'm supposed to go. Satan's desire is to have you live in defeat. God says we are more than a conqueror, that we can do all things through Christ. And, of course, Satan wants us, you don't have to do that today. He wants us to delay God says, now is the time. Get your house in order. Get your life in order. Get things in order, knowing that I am with you and that I will see you through these things and my blessing will be upon your life. God's story is his story of creation. He created us because he loves us. He now has us here in, our, in this place, in this time, in this family, because he loves us. And he wants nothing but the best for our lives. So let us speak the truth of God's word and let us allow that word to influence our thoughts, influence our relationships, influence the direction of our life, and hold on to the promise knowing that God will never leave me nor forsake me, that God has a plan and a purpose for our life, and nothing, no one can defeat the Lord Jesus Christ. He has crushed the head of Satan, and we are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's stand, shall we? God, we thank you for the, for the strength of your spirit, for the enlightenment of your word, for the power of your spirit, for the influence of how that you walk among us and how that you let us know that we are loved by you. Nothing can ever separate us from you. God, you give us the strength, the power, the ability to choose correctly. So, Lord, guide us in our steps. Guide us in our thoughts. Let us know, Lord, that in you we are more than a conqueror. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayers. And, Lord, thank you for your story, your story about creation, about life and hope. God, you have a plan. You have a purpose. We surrender ourselves to you. Forgive us of our sins, O God, of anything that would hinder your blessing from coming into our life, and let us walk this path with you victoriously and in confidence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.